morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. Welcome to this uh, STARS webinar. I'm Tony Schoenenberger. I'm the executive chairman of STARS. STARS is a platform for dialogue, particularly for leaders in business and society to discuss uh, developments which will impact our society as a whole and our businesses in the next couple of years. Today, actually, we are starting a new series of uh, STARS webinars, namely the US in an emerging multipolar world. We are planning four webinars, one every month, focusing on foreign, domestic, and economic issues. The very first session today will be on the final end of the Pax Americana. And I have the really great pleasure to welcome Ivo Dalda. Ivo, great to have you with us. Wonderful to be here, Tony. Ivo Dalda is the president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Before, he served as the US ambassador to NATO. Ivo, we are very much looking forward to your insights and particularly looking forward to having you again as a speaker at the upcoming STARS Switzerland Symposium in September of uh, next year. I want to introduce you now to our moderator, Mark Dickley. He is the CEO and editor of The Market, the leading digital business and finance platform in Switzerland. Mark is going to moderate the four webinars on the USA. Thank you very much again, Mark, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Tony. Um, hello to uh, Ivo in, in Chicago and hello to everyone uh, from a snowy Zurich today. Um, we have half an hour and uh, as always, I'd like to take uh, to do this as interactive as possible. So I invite you all to uh, just ask your questions, please uh, type your questions in writing with the Q&A format. You find it in the in the black bar uh, in the lower part of your Zoom window. So throughout this webinar, you can uh, ask your question and, and I'll do my best to uh, take them all in. Now, Ivo, I'd like to start uh, the, the title of today's webinar is The Final End of Pax Americana and the implications for international companies. Now, the first question is, is Pax Americana really over? Well, not yet. Uh, and, and the real question, I think, for the future is uh, whether it will actually disappear and be replaced by either a new uh, um, hegemony and a new international order that is uh, guided and led by another power, uh, or uh, it is a more multipolar order in which there are competing visions for how nations and, and uh, actors within the international sphere need to interact, or, and, and that is still the very real possibility, that uh, the current order gets adapted to new circumstances, as it's done for the last 80 years, uh, in which the centrality of the United States as the pinnacle both of the security order and in some ways uh, of uh, a leadership around the globe remains uh, real and, and to some extent unquestioned. Uh, and I think the answer to that question uh, lies as much in what happens internally in the United States as it does throughout the region. It is very easy to talk about uh, the rise of new powers, uh, and that is certainly happening, and it's been happening for a long time, the rise of Europe, the rise of China, the, the, the somewhat re-emergence of Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and to think that that's what drives international politics, um, my view is that what has uh, uh, what what remains critical is does the United States have the internal capacity to continue to lead in the way that it has done before in this new system? And I think the, the, the answer to that question is very much open uh, and not at all uh, determined yet. If we take the, the global view first, um, in terms of economics, Pax Americana was characterized by a rules-based world economic order, by a continuing globalization, and basically just regions and countries growing together through trade and interaction. Uh, now that world-based trade order has, has received a series of hits, obviously 
the pandemic, but before the pandemic already, the, uh, the Trump administration's uh, trade war against China and, and, and some other countries. Do you see that part of Pax Americana, the, the rules-based world economic order, as, as over or, uh, put somewhat differently, seriously challenged? Yes, I think it's seriously challenged, and I think it is, uh, it is undergoing a change uh, in which the focus on globalization and the idea that every part and every corner of the world and every nation on the world will be incorporated within a singular set of rules about how to interact uh, economically, th primarily through the issues of trade, that one, we've never achieved that uh, uh, end point. Uh, but two, that's not always been the case in the rule economic rules based order throughout the Cold War, the rules based that that free trade regime existed within the West, but did not exist uh, uh, in the in the second world uh, among uh, the Soviet Union and its and its partners, as well as uh, in some ways, uh, including China. And it wasn't part of the, the third world or the developed world, uh, which was still very much left behind and not really part of that economic order. I think what we're seeing uh, is that after 30 years of rapid globalization with extraordinary benefits for, for the people uh, uh, around the world, um, I just was reading a, 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 a study by McKinsey that shows that uh, 1.1 billion Chinese uh, are now uh, living in places in which the per capita income is is close to 10,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, that's a that wasn't the case uh, prior to globalization. That was a, 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 a result of globalization. But we are moving into a new era in which strategic competition, uh, uh, geopolitical factors are going to interfere with and in many ways shape the global economic order, just as it, as it shapes the global uh, political order. And the big challenge for the United States uh, is how can it compete effectively on the economic and strategic realm with a country like China by marshalling the resources and capabilities of its friends and allies in the Western world and use an economic uh, means uh, as a way to, cha to, to, to channel both that competition and to address serious global issues uh, like climate change. And I think we're in the cusp of a new way in which the global order is going to be uh, managed on the economic side, more fragmented, more divided, uh, but deepened uh, among Western countries. Uh, and we're already seeing all kinds of negotiations on uh, providing climate uh, um, uh, preferences to trade, for example. Uh, we're having a big uh, debate between the United States and Europe and its Asian friends about subsidies and industrial policy, both on semiconductors uh, and, and electronic uh, electric vehicles and batteries and supply chains. Uh, and if the U.S. plays this wisely, which is an if, uh, it can multiply and, 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 and bring to, within that orbit a larger and larger number of countries uh, to benefit uh, the whole world, while still being able to compete effectively uh, with a rising China. Now that um, strategic competition more and more is being characterized by, on the one hand, we have the liberal democratic West, um, which includes Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and so on. And on the other hand, we have authoritarian uh, regimes China, Russia, Iran, maybe Saudi, and so on. Is that kind of that characterization into two blocks? Is that valid in your view? Is that the kind of world that we will be dealing with in the next years to come? So it, I, I don't think we're going to go back to a world that we saw in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, uh, uh, a Cold War truly divided between two blocks that saw how to deal with each other in, in zero sum terms that the only way to win was for the other side to lose. I don't think we're going to be in that kind of uh, uh, zero sum world. There are too many global challenges that affect both uh, authoritarian and democratic societies from, as we are seeing, pandemics uh, to climate change, uh, to the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, in which cooperation among major powers, no matter whether they are liberal and democratic or whether they are 
uh, um, authoritarian is necessary. Uh, the, the, the way, however, in which that is going to, uh, I think, evolve is less by sitting down constantly at the table and negotiating big deals between, say, China and the United States, and more through a competitive structure, uh, a, uh, a way in which uh, uh, the, the countries uh, that are more like-minded, that are more liberal and open in their economic and political systems uh, uh, work together uh, to create uh, pressure on the other side to follow suit. And we've just seen that happen uh, just in the last few days. When China opened, uh, decided to open up, as of two days ago, uh, its society and end zero COVID on the dime, it was doing that not only because of public protests internally, which I think uh, were major, but also because it understood that economically cutting itself off from the rest of the world was hurting the Chinese economy and the Chinese uh, uh, possibility for development. And that I would not be surprised that if you see in the next uh, few uh, weeks or, or, or so, China opening up not only uh, uh, in terms of putting down the lockdown restrictions, but allowing mRNA vaccines from Western countries to come in in order to deal uh, with the likely uh, consequences of, of opening up. And it's that kind of competition uh, that is not zero sum because vaccines are good for everyone. Uh, having a vaccinated world is a, is a is a win 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 solution, uh, but it's done through competition uh, rather and economic in some ways economic principles rather than uh, through cooperation. So that's the that's the shift that I see happening. And in some ways, the competition is going to uh, set uh, against each other. The more authoritarian systems. Xi Jinping today is in Saudi Arabia uh, versus the more collaborative and, and, and liberal systems where the Asian, European, North American and, and, and other democracies work together on these issues. Now, in terms of the strategic competition between the two superpowers, the US and China, um, until November, it looked like they they kind of escalate and escalate. Uh, we've had uh, Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan in, in August. We've had the uh, the increased uh, sanctions in terms of semiconductors by the Biden administration in early October. And then the two men met in Bali in November, uh, the two presidents, Biden and Xi Jinping. And it kind of looked like they came to an agreement not to not to take the escalation uh, further. How did you read that meeting and what we have seen since? So I, I, I think uh, that it was good for uh, the presidents uh, to meet in person and sort of take uh, each other's temperature. They hadn't been meeting and they hadn't met in person because of COVID uh, since Biden had become president. Of course, they knew each other really well. They were both vice presidents at the same time. Uh, they had a personal uh, understanding of each other, and it was important. It's always important to look each other in the eye to understand what was happening. Uh, but I think the meeting itself was enabled by a more structural uh, issue. I think the Chinese have realized, uh, and Xi Jinping in particular is realizing, that, uh, that the economy and its society is in deep trouble. Uh, that, in fact, at this point, uh, accelerating a competition with the United States uh, may not be in China's interest. And while you have seen a very robust and, and new sort of foreign policy emerging from Xi Jinping, much more ideological and less driven by economics, the abandonment of Deng Xiaoping's uh, idea that you hide your, uh, you bide your time and, 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 and hide your, your, your face in order to compete more effectively, peaceful rise as, as it used to be, that was replaced by wolf warrior diplomacy, by uh, the kind of very aggressive actions in response to Nancy Pelosi's visit, which when you come to it was just a visit of a congressional leader, uh, no different than it happened in, in the past and will happen again in the future uh, to Taipei. Uh, and, and but the realization that maybe this wasn't actually serving Chinese interests. Uh, and I think the zero COVID change is another indication that China actually doesn't at this moment benefit from an escalation in, in the competition and is much better placed to one compete effectively, which it will continue to do uh, uh, on issues like semiconductors and robotics and quantum and, and, and AI. Uh, the competition was started by the Chinese a long time ago, 
uh, and it's in some ways the U.S. Uh, and, and the rest catching up to it, but to doing it in this way that, that I described before, not inevitably leading to a division of the world into two blocks or inevitably leading to a world uh, in, in which the only way you advance is by the other side losing. Uh, I still think we live in a way, uh, in a world, and I think the Chinese keep saying it, uh, where win-win is possible. But win-win doesn't necessarily mean that you do it through the kind of collaboration we see in the European Union, uh, but the win-win can happen through the kind of competition that we're seeing increasingly uh, in, uh, in the relationship between these two major powers. Now, in terms of its um, semiconductor sanctions, the Biden administration is leaning rather heavily on, for example, the, the Dutch government, uh, uh, the Japanese, the South Koreans, to join them in um, cutting off China from receiving high-end uh, technology for which is needed for the production of, of uh, ultra-high-end semiconductors. In terms of the business uh, community, the business environment, will it more and more be that businesses will have to pick sides? Um, you know, a, a company in the Netherlands will have to pick sides. Can I still uh, supply clients in China or will I have to abide by rules uh, that, that the US basically tells me to? Yeah, I th so I think that is the, the 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 shift that we're seeing—a shift in which geopolitical considerations uh, and geostrategic considerations need to be taken into account in making dis business decisions. Uh, by the way, that was true throughout the Cold War, uh, and so it's not that this is something new and we've never seen. What was new and what we've never seen is what's happened in the last thirty years, which is in which business decisions were made on the basis of economic return and economic considerations without any regard to their geopolitical impact. Uh, and so a business like a big chemical industrial company in, uh, in, in Germany uh, decides that it can expand its reach in, in, in that country because it, it, it has uh, what it believes a secure supply of very cheap gas. Um, and the moment that geopolitics changes, which is what happens when Russia invades in neighbor and try to gobble up uh, uh, most, if not all of its territory, uh, the geopolitics will start to interfere in that decision deliberation. Uh, and the company that uh, relies on cheap Russian gas now has to reassess how it needs to think about not only its immediate, but its long-term future. I think that's what's happening with regard to China in some ways, because we are living in a different world. We're no longer living in a world in which China is willing to open up its markets uh, and and uh, uh, and where in which the bottom line uh, in the in the short term is what should drive business decisions. China very clearly is not playing uh, an economic globalization game. It is playing an economic nationalism game and it's done so for 40 years. It is required and acquired required. Uh, technologies to share, uh, companies to share technology, uh, to invest in certain ways and not in certain other ways. It has, in fact, never really abided by this open globalized economic system. Uh, and it has become richer and more powerful as a result of that. And now I think we in the West are starting to catch up and say, wait a minute, if China and state-based industries, but also private industries are going to be directed geopolitically, maybe we should do that too, particularly on those areas in which the future economic and security competition is likely to be driven, among which high-end chips uh, uh, and semiconductors being about as important as you can possibly have. And so it isn't that ASLM, uh, ASML uh, or, or, or our Japanese, it's, it's Japanese equivalent, need to follow you as rules. It is that they need to understand that the competition that we are engaged in is one factor that needs to be taken apart in their business decisions and actually start thinking about how can we maximize our, 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 to our benefit uh, that relationship? And where is the place in which the advanced technology is likely to be exploding more? Uh, and do I want to be on one side of this divide or on the other side of that divide and, and take that into account? So if you're sitting in a boardroom, if you're sitting in the C-suite, uh, the, the day in which you can ignore what's happening politically is over. 
Uh, and we, we saw that on February 24. And that's true, by the way, not just for high end industry. It's true for the lowest level industry. I live in Chicago. McDonald's is headquartered here. And McDonald's had to figure out on the 24th of February what to do with its uh, with its franchises that were deploying 65,000 people. McDonald's is not going to win the military competition between the Russia and, and Ukraine, or indeed Russia and the West. But being part of the Russian economy does have implications geopolitically that now have to be taken into account, which is why McDonald's decided first to shut down their businesses, but now actually to divest uh, from, from the Russian economy. So we're living in this era, uh, not because the US wants you to, but because the reality of the economic competition forces one uh, into this era. And, and it isn't about who to blame, it's about how to adapt to that new reality in which geopolitics becomes as in, in, in some ways, depending on your business, more important uh, than your uh, immediate economic uh, benefit. And it's squaring that circle rather than denying its existence. That's now the challenge for business in Europe, in the United States, uh, and, and of course in Asia and in many other countries. Just a reminder for the audience, whenever you have a question, just type it in with the Q&A format and I'll, and I'll take it up there. So you would say, Ivo, that basically the past 30 years, those were the aberration. Those were an um, extraordinarily uh, good or easy time for uh, global businesses. And now we go going back to a, a more difficult and uh, uh, time like we had before the late 1980s. No, I, I, not, it's not quite so black and white. I mean, clearly the last 30 years have been an aberration. Uh, the, 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 the idea that business uh, makes decisions basically on, on, uh, on economic and market uh, uh, factors and can ignore geopolitics, that's unique. It, it in fact, has never happened in, uh, before, and it's not gonna be the case uh, thereafter. However, the difference between what happened before uh, during the Cold War and what will come now is, is, is that at that point in the Cold War, there was no economic interaction uh, between the Soviet Union and, and the Soviet-led system uh, and, uh, and the United States. And in fact, China's opening was designed to, to find a way out of that stricture economically, politically, and strategically. Uh, uh, and that led uh, to the opening of China, which happened before the end of the Cold War. Remember, it started in the, in the 70s and, and accelerated in the 80s, but really took off in the 90s and the 2000s, in part because the US government, European governments, and everyone else believed that if you encourage economic interdependence, economic action, and economic uh, uh, liberalization opening, you would have political liberalization opening following in, in its course. That economic globalization could drive uh, liberal uh, de uh, democratic uh, uh, development in these societies. It was known as the, sort of the end of history uh, theory, the final stage of history. Well, that turned out to be wrong. Uh, and I think we have now seen that rather than opening up, it actually led to a new form of authoritarianism, a new form of control. And in some ways, Xi Jinping is now the most powerful leader in China since Mao Zedong. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party is more dominant in, this, in Chinese society than at any time since Mao Zedong. Uh, and its control over its people through a surveillance state in other ways is more uh, uh, is, is more real and strong than uh, since uh, than any time since Mao Zedong. So you do have a, a system that has uh, opened up uh, economically, has benefited millions, I mean billions of people in its own society, but it hasn't led to political liberalization. And so now we need to live in a new world in which economic interaction will continue. We're not going to see the decoupling of the Chinese economy from the West. Uh, except in some high-end communications, uh, semiconductors uh, areas. Um, but, you know, if we can get cheaper T-shirts that are made, uh, hopefully not with slave labor uh, in, in China, then why, why not? That's the, the, the Adam Smith theory of trade and Ricardo, and, and Ricardo they haven't, uh, those, those, those economic uh, theories haven't, uh, uh, haven't uh, been abandoned. Uh, uh, but it is going to be driven in part by that strategic competition. And that's what's new. Now, with that world, as you the new world, as you describe it, and that's a question from the audience here, are our current multilateral institutions still capable of 
government governing that kind of world or do they need to be changed and, and adapted as well? well they, they need to be changed and adapted uh, uh, because uh, those institutions in some ways stem from the 1940s uh, and have now gone through not one, not two, but are going through a third global transition and how to think about global order. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the reasons that the United Nations uh, in its in its security and even in its economic and social aspects really hasn't been able to to um, meet the test of its time is because it's based on principles uh, that are not the dominant ones in economic and 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 uh, political relationships. We still have a world of great powers. Uh, that's not going to change. Uh, we don't have uh, a world in which everyone is sovereign, equal, and and one uh, one vote and one for one nation is how we we run global affairs. Uh, the same is true with the IMF and the World Bank, which have consistently changed the way they are operating because the global economy is operating. And so our global international institutions will have to adapt. And if they don't, they will have to take, as in many ways they already have done, uh, a, a, a backseat to more regional uh, 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 systems. Uh, and you know, if you take the European multilateral system, it has constantly evolved uh, since the late 1940s, early 1950s, until where it is today. Every crisis has led to more Europe, not less. Uh, particularly in the last 10 and 15 years. And so there is an adaptation that's constantly going on. The key is to understand that. Uh, cooperation, which is necessary in collaboration to deal with issues, takes place within a larger power system uh, that, in, uh, that, that to some extent drives the nature of how one interacts uh, and, and can't be overcome just because we want to have a multilateral system that sits on top of, uh, uh, of, um, of that competition. But within blocks, within fragments, Yes, I think you're going to have a continuing uh, multilateralism because it's important uh, that we do so when it comes to big global challenges, whether it's the WHO uh, or, or, or the UN Conference on, for the Protection of Climate, uh, you will see much more integration of, uh, of international effort. But even those tend to be driven by what happens uh, by and, uh, and among the great powers. Uh, they just provide better rules for that interaction than if they didn't exist. So we want them, but they need to adapt. Uh, we are almost out of time already, but Ivo, you, uh, in the very beginning, you said, um, uh, you talked about the U.S. and you said, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens there, whether the U.S. can continue playing its leading role. Now, especially from the vantage point of Europe, after the four Trump years, many people are asking themselves, how reliable a partner is the US going to be in the coming years uh, in, in that world as you just described it? Well, that is, I mean, I, as, uh, uh, as I, I said at the outset, that is the key. That's the question. Uh, frankly, it's a question in the United States too. Uh, and there has been deep concern uh, for the last two years, no matter, in particular, given the kind of politics that that seems to have uh, pervaded a part of the political system here. Uh, whether the United States will ever be able to come back as a uh, as a country that people uh, in the world, people like me who grew up in Europe uh, and then be uh, came to the United States as an immigrant, uh, saw as that beacon of openness and freedom. And now uh, uh, we, we see developments that are deeply troubling. Um, uh, and so I do think that is the real question. I don't know the answer, uh, uh, whether in fact the US can find a way back to that leadership role. It certainly has under the current administration. And I think uh, the, the, the good news is that if you look at the politics that is playing out in the United States at the moment, uh, uh, there is a reason to believe that we won't go back to the kind of Trumpian America first, I don't, you know, my friends are my enemies and my enemies are my friends uh, kind of worldview uh, because it's losing out politically. Uh, Donald Trump has now lost three of the last four elections he ran in. In fact, he lost the fourth one too in terms of popular votes. Uh, and increasingly the Republican party has come to, uh, uh, to see that the, its future probably lies somewhere else than with a return to Donald Trump. Now, I can't guarantee that uh, the voters will ultimately, particularly the Republican voters, will ultimately be uh, a, a, a have the voice on that. 
But I think if you look at what's happened in the last three or four weeks since the midterm election, um, uh, Donald Trump has had uh, probably the worst uh, four weeks in his, of his life. His company has been indicted and, and, and in fact, uh, 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 convicted of, of, of criminal liability uh, and, and everything else that's happening. So politics is changing. Politics is fickle. Uh, and I think if you come back to the kind of leadership role and understanding that really drove American foreign policy from the early 1940s until today, uh, until Donald Trump, um, then uh, I think we can we have a chance uh, to to lead in that new way uh, in this more fractured, uh, fragmented, but still uh, very much global order that we talked about in the last 30 minutes. Now, if you allow a last question from the audience here, given that geostrategic um, chessboard that we see between China on the one hand, the US with some you know questions about its future reliability, what role can and should Europe play within that power game? So I think Europe, and, and by the way, I think that uh, Canada and, and uh, the major East Asian uh, democracies, uh, including Australia and the ones you mentioned earlier, uh, can, can influence where the direction of US policy it goes. It can play a very constructive role to remind the United States that it needs to needs them perhaps as much as, if not more, than the United than uh, than they need the United States. That this is really a uh, a world in which the collaboration among the democracies of North America, Europe, and Asia is in economic, foreign policy, and security terms is absolutely vital for the prosperity and, and uh, freedom of, uh, of all of them. And if they become internally divided, then they lose uh, and, and, uh, and others are gonna win in that competition. And that's the role that I think the European Union is playing uh, with regard to the issue of uh, mentioned earlier, battery and EVs, uh, uh, the, the, that Japan and South Korea in a very quiet uh, uh, way uh, play uh, with their influence in, in in Washington, and so does Australia, and that Canada plays as a major trading partner uh, uh, of the United States to remind uh, people in Washington uh, that they, that working together to solve these issues is far better uh, than looking at the short term gain uh, that might come from working alone. Uh, and I think we're seeing that happening. So that's the voice. It's an important voice. Uh, a voice is stronger and more important than it's ever been. Uh, but exercising that voice uh, is necessary for success. Okay, we have to wrap it up here. Thank you very much, uh, Ivo Dalder, for taking the time. Thanks for being with us. And thank you all in the audience for, uh, for being with us. I wish you all now a, a good evening and uh, a good weekend, wherever you are. Take care and uh, see you soon.